911, where's your emergency? This is the profile of the murderer we are searching for in this 2003 cold case. Although the perpetrator can be male or female, it's typically a male, 18 or younger. He is a loner with minimal education and is socially inadequate. Most likely he is unemployed or employed in an occupation that requires little to no skills. He probably has a history of substance abuse and has been arrested for minor offenses. He lives within one mile of the crime scene. He is familiar with the crime scene and can justify his presence in the area. The crime is about power and control. This perpetrator has a feeling of emotional chaos inside. Watching chaos outside of himself brings a sense of calmness to the pain, anger, and sadness he feels inside. The murderer we are searching for took the lives of five college students on April 13, 2003. The murderer that we are searching for is an arsonist. If you go to the Attorney General's website for cold cases in your state, you will find that each victim has been assigned a case number, but they are more than a number. They are loved, they are missed, and their lives have been tragically cut short. Each victim begs to never be forgotten, for hope still lies within those case numbers, a hope that their story will be told again and again and again until someone comes forward with information to put their killer behind bars. We have five case numbers, five victims of a horrible senseless crime that took place at a rooming house one block from the Ohio State University campus. Here is a look at the young students who had their lives abruptly and cruelly taken in a fire set by an arsonist. Erin DeMarco, age 19. Erin was voted most talkative girl in her senior year of high school. She was bubbly, energetic, personable, and could strike up a conversation and keep it going with anyone. Erin loved to travel and spoke fluent Italian and Spanish. She was studying pre-law at Ohio University and had planned to work the summer of 2003 for the Stark County Family Court. Christine Wilson, age 19. Christine came from a very close-knit family and had made many trips home to be with them while attending Ohio University. She loved children, and friends say she wore a permanent smile and knew and practiced the simple rules of making those around her happy. Christine majored in retail merchandising and was excited about her future. Those who knew her said she was a well-rounded person that was well-liked by everyone. Andrea Dennis, age 20. Andrea was a former homecoming queen and her mother Patty said she was every mother's dream daughter. She was studying journalism at Ohio University 
and had just met a young man that she had fallen in love with. Patty said, I'm so grateful she had that before she died. Every mother wants that for her daughter. Kyle Rowland, age 20. Kyle was captain of his high school soccer and basketball teams. He was studying business at Ohio State and was hoping to combine business with his love of sports and go into sports management. His father, Terry, said, Kyle was a great kid. He was very considerate and empathetic towards others, and he was great with small kids. Alan Schlesman, age 21. Alan, nicknamed Big Al for his big heart, was a great athlete. He was captain of the golf, basketball, and tennis teams and state champion in golf during his senior year of high school. Alan loved children and often worked with handicapped students. He was employed as a server at Max and Irma's restaurant while majoring in business at Ohio State. A co-worker said, he was a very sweet guy and a very happy kid. He always had a smile on his face. Now that we know the profile of the perpetrator of these crimes and who the victims were, I think it's very important to understand why the victims were unable to escape the fire. Let's take a few moments to realize just exactly what happens when people are trapped in a burning home. The fire in this case took place in a rooming house leased by Alan and Kyle and 10 others. The other three victims, Aaron and Christine and Andrea, were guests staying over that night. We know that Alan and Kyle were well aware of the home's exits and the young women were probably somewhat familiar with the layout of the house. So why did they perish and the other occupants did not? One reason is that six of the 14 occupants were on the first floor of the house where the fire broke out, so they had time to flee out of the back of the house. The other eight victims were located on the second floor of the three-story home. They were overtaken by carbon monoxide poisoning and smoke inhalation. Firemen were able to rescue three of them. Once the fire begins, it takes about one minute for the smoke to fill the room and it spreads as rapidly as the flames. The smoke is so thick and dense that the occupants become disoriented. The fire consumes the oxygen the individuals need to breathe, and it happens so quickly that the victims are overcome and are not able to reach the exits. This chart illustrates what happens to a person at various oxygen levels. A fully developed indoor fire can reach or exceed temperatures of 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Even one breath of this hot air can be lethal. Inhaling superheated gases can burn your respiratory tract whether or not the gas is present or toxic. There are approximately 375 fatalities every year from intentionally set fires and 1,300 victims suffer injuries. One of the many unanswered questions in this case is what led the arsonist to pick this particular location to ignite a fire at 4 a.m.? The intent of the arsonist is usually not to kill. So what provoked him to torch a rooming house that he knew was occupied? Let's take a look at the events leading up to those fateful early morning hours. Just a simple birthday party lies at the core of this story. 
a celebration of victim Alan Schlesman's 21st birthday, a turning point for the young man. He was officially an adult, and to celebrate this momentous occasion, more than 80 people would gather at his rooming house to laugh, dance, drink, and make memories. To kick off the weekend celebration, Alan and some of his buddies met his parents and family at a restaurant in Columbus. His mother, Lori, said, Just seeing him drive away that night, he had a huge smile on his face and was so happy surrounded by his buddies. We had no idea what was going to happen. The three-story yellow brick rooming house at 64 East 17th Avenue sat in a student neighborhood and within walking distance of the nation's second largest campus. The 80 students that gathered at the house included some from as far away as Boston and as near as Ohio University, the alma mater of sorority sisters Erin, Christine, and Andrea. It was a warm spring evening. The party began early and spilled out onto the front porch and into the sloped front yard. There were at least four cakes and a dozen cases of beer. One of the guests said, it was a big party, but it wasn't out of control. There were no problems. But that wasn't exactly true. There were a few verbal altercations that night, and one of those would remain at the forefront of this investigation. At one point during the evening, there was a confrontation in the parking lot behind the rooming house. One of the party goers caught a man trying to steal car stereos. The man was described as a white male, about 20 years old, weighing 200 pounds. He was 5 feet 11 inches with shaggy blonde hair. Witnesses say he wore a dark blue denim jacket with a picture of Snoop Dogg on the back. Police would later learn that this person was Robert Lucky Patterson. Patterson would quickly become a person of interest in this case. The other verbal altercation started at 3 a.m. A shouting match took place between two men, including one who lived at the house, when a guest tried to lift a refrigerator on a dare. Witnesses say there were no punches thrown. Authorities did not believe that the argument had anything to do with the fire. After that last argument, the party wound down and guests started leaving. The only occupants remaining were the victims and nine others. It's unknown what happened between 3 and 4.05 a.m. when an anonymous 911 call was made by a woman walking down the street. She said, Half the house is lit up in flames. The arsonist had set a couch on fire that was on the front porch by the front door. Flames quickly engulfed the front of the house. Engine 13 was dispatched to the rooming house. Firemen Mike Bernheimer, Scott Kolpa, Brian Morstadt, and Lieutenant Carl Jepson were filling in for call-offs and those who had the day off. They weren't supposed to be the rescuers. They were supposed to help the first engine company battle the flames, but 90 seconds after arriving, they would save the lives of three college students. It was the most intense fire Engine 13 had ever faced. Morstadt was the first to see the wall of fire consuming the front of the house perched on a hill. Engine 13 stopped at the corner and the four firefighters charged up the grassy incline, ducking to avoid flames rolling from the windows above. One student who had escaped the blaze calmly told Bernheimer to go to the second floor, the second bedroom on the left. Others were yelling, second floor second floor. Without grabbing a hose, Bernheimer raced up the fire escape 
and dove across the second floor threshold without an oxygen mask or gloves. The hallway was dark and full of smoke. Fires are noisy, they roar and crackle, but the back hallway on the second floor was eerily silent. The flames had not spread there, but the smoke had, and it was becoming hotter with each passing second. Bernheimer was now joined by the three other firefighters. While he put on his gear, he told the others that they needed to go left. Morstadt crawled through a bedroom door on the right and reached out just as Jennifer Laren collapsed on top of him. As he carried her over his shoulder, he was met by Bernheimer, who took her and dragged her to the parking lot below. Jepson, the only paramedic, took over from there. Back upstairs, Kolpa crawled on the left side of a hallway, sometimes sliding along on his stomach, searching where the students had told him to go. Holding an axe in his right hand, he reached through the smoke with his left and felt something soft. It was the leg of Jillian Gardner. She was unconscious and laying face down on the floor. Kolpa rolled her to her back and pulled her into the hallway. He climbed on top of her and, fishing his arms through hers, crawled out on his knees in forearms. Once out on the fire escape, Kolpa handed her off to Bernheimer. Inside the hallway, flames now began to spread down from the ceiling. Morstop was yelling for survivors. He crawled deeper into the bedroom where he found the first victim, and he heard wheezing from Josh Patterson. Morstadt kept losing his grip on Patterson as he tried to drag him feet first to the bedroom door. Morstadt yelled for help, and Kolpa raced in to help grab Patterson. Halfway down the fire escape, Morstadt, Kolpa, Bernheimer, and Jepson saw fire shoot out of the house. It had flashed, causing everything to burst into flames. Jepson said, there's nobody that can survive this now. It would take over an hour for firefighters to get the fire under control. And then the hard part. The families of the young students who didn't make it out of the blaze would have to be notified. The investigation of the fire itself would take a while. Arson investigations commonly take a year or longer because they have to build a case on a lot of circumstantial evidence. This case would be difficult for the police as well. Tracking down the 80 guests at the party, talking to neighbors, and not to mention trying to interview as many students as possible before many of them would graduate and slip away. Police were under pressure to find the perpetrator, not only for the victims' families, but from students as well, for no one felt safe anymore. Investigators would not give out a lot of information about the fire. The accelerant that was used to start the fire on the front porch was not disclosed to the public. But they did say that the residence, a licensed rooming house, had passed its annual city inspection, and the house had working smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. Reports came back on each of the victims, and their official cause of death was smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning. Tests showed that the five had been drinking alcohol, but not enough that would have hindered their escape. All five deaths were declared a homicide. Tips began to roll in, and Columbus homicide detective Mike McCann started piecing together witness reports about the confrontation students had with the thief in the parking lot. Soon all eyes would turn to Robert Lucky Patterson. Patterson seemed to check all the boxes of the arsonist profile. McCann was sure he had the perpetrator of this horrible crime. 20-year-old Patterson lived in Columbus for several years, moving from place to place, but never leaving the area. He had just been fired from a job making pizzas one month before the blaze at the rooming house. 
co-workers described him as an unhappy heavy drinker who felt unloved by his family. Patterson had a history of setting fires and was working the neighborhood breaking into cars in the early morning hours of April 13th. One fire investigator said, all that is missing is direct evidence linking him to the fire. A little over three months after the crime, Patterson was arrested and charged with five counts of aggravated murder, three counts of attempted aggravated murder, and nine counts of aggravated arson. McCann said Patterson cooperated fully and took a lie detector test. He added Mr. Patterson made statements implicating himself in the fire. When asked by a reporter if Patterson confessed, McCann said he's expressed remorse that five people are dead. The investigation into Patterson revealed that he had lived in a house near the campus, but abandoned it, leaving several things behind, including the Snoop Dogg jean jacket that he had been wearing the night of the fire. A month prior to his arrest, police circulated a photo of the jacket and a description of the suspect, which may have put pressure on Patterson to cooperate with authorities. Franklin County Municipal Judge Stephen Hayes denied Patterson bail after he threatened witnesses. Patterson had threatened to set fire to the homes of at least two of the witnesses. Just when everyone thought the perpetrator had been found and would go to trial for the crimes that he had committed, Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien dismissed charges against Patterson. O'Brien said that he questioned charges after reviewing a videotaped police interview with Patterson and interviewing five witnesses whose statements would be critical to gaining an indictment. O'Brien wouldn't comment on specifics of the case, but did say detectives needed to pursue leads and build a stronger case with direct eyewitness evidence. O'Brien clashed with lead detective Mike McCann over the handling of the case since August of 2003, when the prosecutor freed Patterson. McCann was taken off the case in 2004 so that police could take a fresh look at the case. Some of the victim's family members were frustrated with the police and Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien. In April of 2004, Columbus Police Sergeant Wallace Rushing claimed in a memo that an investigator working for Ron O'Brien was interfering in the arson case. Russian said in the memo that investigator Ron Price was badgering witnesses and subjected them to extraordinary lie detector tests. He also accused Price of conducting scientific fire tests against advice of experts and kept new evidence secret. Russian went on to say, the prosecutor's office has so diluted this case that prosecution of the suspect would almost be impossible at this point. The document was dismissed by top brass in the police department, and Price said he was trying to cooperate the best that he could. Charges were never again filed against Robert Lucky Patterson, and the case quickly went cold and has remained frozen in time for the past 19 years. Detective David Morris of Columbus Police Department's Unresolved Case Review Team once stated to a reporter, after years of investigating the case, Patterson was still considered a person of interest, as well as several others. So many rewards have been offered over the years for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the arsonist. A year after the fire, Central Ohio Crime Stoppers had put up billboards near the campus with pictures of the victims and a message that read, Last year, five students received death by fire. The arsonist received nothing. Who is responsible? Still, no one came forward. This story is full of tragedy. 
It has heroes. It has miracles. And everyone involved has been touched by evil. The parents have moved forward in life with great strength and dignity. The mothers stay in contact and continue to support one another. Alan's mother, Lori, said, In one sense, it's like it just happened. In the other sense, it was like a long, long time ago. Alan's family went on to say, We don't want to see this happen to anybody else. This type of criminal behavior has no place in our society. Alan was a victim of violence, and that's just unbelievably agonizing. After Alan's funeral, a 156-car procession, including a bus carrying his teammates, accompanied his body to the cemetery, where hundreds joined the family for a final prayer. Patty Dennis remembers learning of Andrea's death after returning home from church. She said, I just screamed. I didn't get my purse out of the car for two weeks. I didn't go anywhere. I just sat on the couch and people came to visit me. Days later, she sorted through a garbage bag filled with Andrea's belongings. Patty said, everything was damp and it smelled like a combination of smoke and apple because she had some kind of apple essence shampoo that spilled a little bit. And now, I can't even stand the smell anymore, that apple smell. Kyle's mother, Janet, said she feared the arsonist would strike again. She said, it's too late for Kyle, Alan, and the girls. But if this were to happen to somebody else, it would really be unthinkable. At a memorial for his daughter, Erin, and sorority sisters, Christine and Andrea, Michael DeMarco said that those in attendance should not be too quick to move on. Memorialize this tragedy by your actions. In an emotional message to his daughter, he said, come and visit me in my dreams. You are not only my daughter, but my best friend. I'll think of you every day, and I will see you in heaven. Christine's father, Tim, said Christine could captivate. She would walk into a room, and the entire room would light up. Everybody always knew when Christine was there. Much of the day Tim learned of his daughter's death remains a blur. He only remembers sitting in front of his garage door with his head between his legs, not knowing what to do next. As for Robert Lucky Patterson's father, well, he believed his son was not a criminal and had this to say to a reporter, I'm just as much a victim as anyone else, and my son is too. He might have been a little mischievous. He's just a little stupid teenager, that's all. Mr. Patterson went on to say that he was sure his son did not start the fire, but he might know who did. He declared, they just wanted somebody. That's the way I look at it. They just wanted to close the case. My final words on this cold case are the words a victim's family never wants to hear. Abandoned, filed away, not actively being pursued, lack of evidence. Nineteen years ago, someone took the lives of five innocent students. Someone out there knows who the killer is and can help police bring him to justice. And most importantly, bring these families some peace. If you have any information about the events that took place on April 13, 2003, please call the Columbus Police Department at 614-645-4545. 
Thank you for joining me today, and please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. Please take care and be safe until I see you again with another cold case. This is Eye on Justice.